Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Mystery Bible on Podcast. I am here again with our uh, esteemed co-host, Mr. Dan Rundio. Um, he's not a PhD, but his initials are doctor, so that should count for something. And uh, we are going to talk about a topic that many of you have been thinking about, um, asking about from time to time. We are going to discuss the famous or infamous book of Enoch. There's a, so much to say about the book of Enoch, and I wanted to bring Dan in for this conversation. And as I always say, we could do many episodes on the book of Enoch. There's a lot there. But for those of you who have no clue what we're talking about and are searching the table of contents for your of your Bible, trying to figure out what we're talking about, uh, rest assured, we're going to give you uh, plenty of context and plenty to think about. But it is a very timely and meaningful conversation to be discussing the book of Enoch here and now. And Dan is a great co-host for this. So uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you so much, by the way, for sharing this podcast and telling people about it. We have literally dozens of listeners, which is so exciting to see. And we're so gratified to see that people are, and we're getting messages too from people uh, who know us from you know former lives and are saying how much they're appreciating the podcast. And that just that that means so much. That's why we're doing this. It's it's really the only reason. We want you all to be edified and uplifted. We want you to be uh, re-examining your Bible in closer detail. We want you to be uh, igniting your love of scripture and getting so excited about scripture. Uh, we're not here saying we know all the answers. We're just looking at real interesting materials and saying, what does this tell us about our creator? What does this tell us about our savior? What does this tell us about the word of God? And there's a, you know, there's a lot of, a lot we can take from these things, even inside the Bible and outside the Bible. So you're going to hear the Bible reference tonight, but you're also going to hear a very, very, very old document very controversial document called the Book of Enoch. So I want to welcome my uh, good friend and esteemed co-host, Mr. Dan Rundio. I don't think he needs that much of an introduction, so let's not spend a lot of time there. But um, Dan, go ahead and jump in with your initial impressions or thoughts or basic introduction to the Book of Enoch, and I'll I'll try to avoid interrupting and talking over you and me, my excitement as I, as I often do. Um, I'm so glad you're here and I'm so glad we've been able to, to work on these things together. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, have this neat conversation about this incredible document with you here with our listeners. Yeah. Thanks, Joel. It, it is fun. It, you know, this is another one of those books like I mentioned in the Imagine Heaven book that I wouldn't have read it unless you had recommended it. And it was the same thing with the book of Enoch. You know, you, you hear these books that aren't in the Bible that were rejected from the Bible. And you think as a Christian, you should avoid them. And, um, and then you dig a little deeper and you realize, okay, it's not scripture. It's not in the Bible, but that doesn't mean it's something to be avoided altogether. And, and in fact, as you read it uh, and, and you see that, it referenced in the Bible and and you realize it does have it does have value to offer, even if it's not scripture. So Dan, just in your opinion, why might a Christian bother picking up a copy of the book of Enoch? What's the point? And, and there's a very good argument that many Christians would make of the Bible has everything we need. And by the way, I, I buy that argument and I think you do too. The, the Bible is not lacking in any way. The word of God is complete for everything we need. It's what he's preserved for us. But we keep talking about all these other things kind of around the Bible and saying there's some value to them. What is the value to any given Christian to read some weird old scroll like the book of Enoch? What's the point? Yeah, so I was actually explaining that to somebody earlier today and, and compared the book of Enoch to imagine heaven in that way. Even though the Book of Enoch was written thousands of years ago, Imagine Heaven is recent, neither of them are the Bible, but they both do things that help clarify and help give you some context for things you read in the Bible and things you already know are true. And, and so the Bible is still the ultimate truth and, and you've got to take everything back to Scripture and, and the Word of God. Uh, but there's lots of other good books out there that, you know, truth is still God's truth. 
And, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote great books. They're not the Bible. You can't rely on them the same way as the Bible, even though they have a lot of truth in them. And so it's the same thing with Book of Enoch. I think it 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 does uh, give some more color and detail into some things. And you know it's a book that the the writers of the Bible were familiar with. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really good point. And if I were to answer the question, I think the answer you gave is great, that there's a lot of stuff around the Bible that's helpful. And Paul references outside things. By the way, the Bible, the text of the Bible references, I, and I'm pretty close here. I might be off by plus or minus five, but not plus or minus 50. The Bible references something like 70 books that are not in the Bible or that we don't have copies of, or that we don't have reliable copies of. So there's a lot of context around the Bible that is referenced. Now, we do not take books like Enoch that have a, a biblical name and say, oh, this is inspired, this is infallible, this is true. The reason why is it does it simply does not meet the same criteria of rigor and historical authenticity. We can't verify it to the same degree. There are other books that are referenced in the Bible that we have no idea where they are. And you read the Old Testament, you know, Kings and Chronicles, and they say, are not the rest of this king's deeds written in the annals of the kings of Israel? We're not sure what that book is. Or we see Jasher referenced in the book of Joshua. Well, we have a book called Jasher, but we have no idea if it's the same Jasher referenced in the book of Joshua. It might be a completely different Jasher. By the way, the book of Jasher is a really, really good book to read, but don't read it with the the conviction that this is what Joshua is talking about. It may be, it may not be. But the reason these old books are worth referencing is that they informed the mindset of the original audience of scripture, which is this ancient Hebrew mindset, uh, both second temple period is a, is a, so second temple period, when you think of coming up into the life of Christ as kind of second temple, post Solomon temple, current Herodian temple, these people leading in the, in the generations that were leading up to Christ, there was a second, second temple period mindset. And it was in between the old Testament and the new Testament. So you, so second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, you know, about a generation or so after Christ. So you have the old Testament, the new Testament in between, you have this Jewish population that were the audience for the old Testament and the upcoming audience for the new Testament and not excluding, you know, Gentiles who were included later. And it's really, really helpful to read the Bible with an understanding and a clue of how they saw the world. And they were they didn't have a New Testament at that point. It was before Christ. So they had the Old Testament and a bunch of other stuff. And then when you read the Old Testament, especially the book of Jude and Peter and even the Sermon on the Mount, you get in some cases direct quotes of this book of Enoch. And then in other cases, direct allusions or agreements with the book of Enoch. And what that tells you is, hey, if Jesus was familiar with this book and Peter was clearly familiar with this book and Jude is directly quoting this book, at least some portions of it, it's really helpful. If you want to understand what they're saying, read it, understand you know, what why they would reference the book of Enoch and what it says and what it doesn't say. So I just want to be loud and clear. Uh, we on the Mystery Bible on podcast, and I'm speaking collectively of all myself and the co-hosts and any other co-hosts I have in mind, we are not saying that your Bible is incomplete. It's not. We're not saying that the Bible is not enough. The Bible is absolutely enough. We are not saying that there is other inspired documents that should be, or sorry, correct my grammar, that there are other inspired documents that should be included in the canon of scripture. That's not the point we're taking. What we are saying is, if you're a serious student of the Bible, and if you really want to understand and be able to plumb the depths of what your Bible means, it really helps to have the context of what the original scriptural audience, it helps to have that mindset and have that context so that you can read it and understand it the way they read it and understand it. We talked in a recent episode, a Michael Heiser episode with Brian Brown about how um, John constantly references the Old Testament. If you don't know your Old Testament, you can't understand Revelation. And the, Jesus constantly references the Old Testament. You need to know the Old Testament. You need to know the New Testament. And then there's this other stuff that they reference as well. And if you want to understand the, ki the kind of references they're making, 
it really helps to read the materials that they were reading. And the Book of Enoch, as far as we can tell, is one of those source materials that was being read by Second Temple period Jews, possibly Jews way before that, and possibly even other cultures way before that. We can't say that conclusively. So Dan, is there anything you want to share in terms of the history of the Book of Enoch, the biblical context of the Book of Enoch, anything that you just uh, think gives people some traction and understanding why this book and not these other weird apocryphal books that showed up, you know, 500 years after Christ claiming to be the testament of this person, you know, testament of Mary or this other stuff. We don't take those very seriously, but this one we do take seriously. And why, why the book of Enoch? What's so serious about it? Yeah. Well, there is a important distinction there is that there's could be several things that people are talking about when they mention the book of Enoch. And we're talking about a, a specific part of a specific one of those books. So I think it's usually referred to as first Enoch. And uh, we're really talking about the first 36 chapters, which is uh, what we have the most uh, evidence of uh, as far as being the oldest and uh, existing for hundreds of years before Christ. Yeah, I'll, I'll give, just because I was looking it up earlier today, I'll give the quick uh, history on that. So Enoch, there are three major books of Enoch. One Enoch, specifically chapters one through 36. And you think of chapters, you're like, oh my, that's long. No, some of these chapters are like four sentences. So it's not long. You can listen to it on audio in like an hour or two, the whole first book of Enoch. Um, chapters one through 36 is commonly referred to as the book of the watchers. The reason we take this section of Enoch very seriously, and this is pretty much exclusively what Dan and I will be talking about tonight, is it has far and away the most historical evidence for predating Christ. There's a lot more to the book of Enoch. There's um, Enoch 2 and 3 and the apocalypse of the animals and all these things, which is not the same thing as the book of the giants. Um, all that showed up later. So there were essentially two versions for a long time of the book of Enoch. One was the Ethiopic version. There were three manuscripts of the Ethiopic version. And they were first kind of waved in the air and touted about in about 1773. So right around the time that the United States was becoming a nation. Then there was a, about a hundred years or so later, there was a Greek copy of the book of Enoch and that had Enoch one through three. But the, these were, you know, you, you have some copies showing up nearly 2000 years, more than a thousand years after Christ and going on 2000 years after Christ of this very old book that had been preserved with this kind of murky background in history. And we knew it was a big deal, especially because we could find some quotes of it from scripture, but you didn't really know if it predated the New Testament. Well, then in 1947, you have this event that you hear us talk about a lot called the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Shepherd Boy and Qumran and the southern part of Israel finds a pottery jar and then finds out that there's a whole lot of pottery jars and a lot of caves. Uh, get, he gets some um, archaeologists involved and they start pulling out these scrolls that are uh, just definitively, absolutely predating Christ. And in, among these scrolls, and there's a lot of them, by the way, and Enoch wasn't found until the fourth cave. Um, among them, you find every single book of the Old Testament. And that's really cool. So I've, I've seen, I've literally laid eyes personally on the Isaiah scroll and I'm not a linguist, but if you translate the Isaiah scroll from predating Christ and the Dead Sea Scrolls are probably two to 300 years before Christ, by the way, it's the same Isaiah that we have today. So what that says is, oh, our Old Testament record is very sound. You can go back 2,500 years and find the the way they explain the Old Testament and the, the copies of the Old Testament they had were the same as ours. Well, included with the Dead Sea Scrolls are lots of other scrolls. Jubilees is one of them. We haven't talked about at all about Jubilees. Without, we, maybe we'll do a future episode on that. Uh, and Enoch is another one, specifically Enoch 1 through 36, the first book of Enoch. Now, the later books of Enoch have not yet been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's why we focus on this first book and say, we can say with some uh, you know, authority that this predates Christ. It probably comes from a very, very old source, but even if somebody made it up and wrote it right before it was buried, which isn't likely because they probably wouldn't have taken the trouble to preserve it, 
then it's at least 300 years older than Jesus. And Jesus, you know, being Jesus's birth. So that's an extremely meaningful archaeological record. And then piling on top of that, the fact that Jude quotes the book of Enoch directly, especially the the very beginning of the book of Enoch, and Peter directly alludes to it. And Jesus says a handful of things that are very much in line with the kind of language and the kind of allegories that it uses. What that tells us is, gosh, we should take this really, really seriously. So Dan, um, and so that was a little bit of a monologue on my end, but <laughs> Let's talk what we haven't talked at all about, because so I was giving kind of the history of the book of Enoch. We haven't talked at all about what it says. What is what are these the Enoch one through thirty six? What does it say? Yeah, I mean it goes through a lot of um well so you know who his who Enoch is, is he was the seventh well, from Adam. You know, he was Noah's great grandfather. And so he lived in this time before the flood. And so a lot of this book is is about the history that happened during that time. And um, so how, let's just give some perspective. So how how long ago was that? So we're we're talking about the very, very early epochs of human history. So you're talking seventh from Adam. You, you mean if Adam lived 900 odd years, Enoch knew Adam, the first right. Adam, the original Adam, because Noah died right or, or Noah was born right around the time Adam died. And if Enoch is Adam's great grandfather, Enoch may have hung out with Adam for a, a hundred or 200 years. And I haven't drawn all the timelines on it, but I think I feel pretty confident that's about right. That's yeah. crazy. You're talking Which about a dude means- that new stuff and was so close to begin. And again, we don't know for certain if Enoch wrote what is called the book of Enoch, but we do know that the narrative of Enoch is from that time. And this is attributed to Enoch and we have very, very old copies of it and that the, the biblical people took this very seriously and they attributed it to Enoch. So who knows? But even if it's post Enoch, we're talking about events and people that were at the extreme beginning of humankind. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, you, like you said, if, if Enoch knew Adam and he also knew Noah, that's spanning the entire time of humanity up until the flood. Uh, so that's, Which is for people who don't know their Bible really well, it's a long time. There's, it's not like Adam and then the flood happened, you know, 50 years later. There's, it's a period of arguably two to 3000 years, arguably. And the, there's a, a lot of argument about that because the way they kept calendars and times were different then. But we're talking that as long as there was between Jesus and us may have been the kind of time frame that was between Adam and Noah. So huge portion of human history about which we have very, we have uh, nine chapters of Genesis, a little bit of the book of Jubilees, a little bit of book of Jasher, and this book of Enoch. And, and, and you could, there are other historical references. So there's lots of legends and stuff around it, including um, Josephus and, and Herodotus. They talk about these things. But one of the only books that claims to actually be from that time period is the Book of Enoch. Yeah, and, and you talk about those first few chapters of Genesis. And a lot of what Enoch does is, is fill in where you have maybe a verse or two in Genesis that mm-hmm. says something and you're like, what in the world was that just talking about? And then Enoch goes in and fills in a lot of those gaps and and gives a lot more detail. So what does he say? What's he talking about? Uh, I mean, you, you talk about things like uh, the when the angels, um, the, the watchers were were tempted and uh, saw saw the human women and came down and sinned and you know, it even talks about their conversations about are we going to do this we're going to get in trouble we're going to do it are you are you in this with me these crazy conversations uh, about um, about 
how intentional the sin was and and then the consequences of that and and kind of how upset God is with these watchers um, and it, it says several times uh, kind of a repeating theme throughout Enoch is is how upset God is because these watchers have wronged mankind and and hurt people and and did things that they shouldn't have done that were really harming this young human race. Okay. I agree with everything you've said there, but I, I want to throw a, a, a challenge out. <laughs> Let's imagine that somebody who has only, only has a basic Sunday school background on the Bible is listening to this podcast because some weird friend of theirs sent it to them and they have no idea what you're talking about. They're like, I don't, I've read the Bible. I heard of Noah. I heard of Adam. What are you going on about? Can you kind of bring it down to this very basic level? I mean, you're talking about watchers. What is that? Is that a biblical term? Is that something? What, what, are, what are you talking about, Dan? I know what you're talking about, but for the benefit of those in the audience who may not know, take a swing at it. Um, if, you know, what's the old, <laughs> explain it like I'm five. You know, kind of, <laughs> yeah. What are we talking about here? From yeah, a biblical so, perspective. Uh, so very early on, you have uh, angels you know, that would be called you know, sons of heaven, seeing the daughters of man and coming down and marrying them and having children. And these children were called the Nephilim, which, uh, you know, in the, in Enoch is usually referred to as giants. I don't think the word Nephilim is in Enoch. Nephilim is an Aramaic word and giants is a Greek word. So it's yeah. in different translations, but right. yeah. So, so wait, is this in the Bible? This sounds like I, if it, let's just say that I'm somebody who grew up in Sunday school, like what, this, I never heard this story. Is this in the Bible? It is. And I recommend listening to a few sermons by Joel Gein on that topic. <laughs> on, on on the the Alethea Church, uh, Colorado YouTube site, yeah. which is still up and running, by the way, you can still pull these down. So this, what what and what I'm kind of goading Dan into is, if you're slightly familiar with your Bible and you've never heard of this, it's because it's not taught on a lot, but it is very much in there. And I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Not only does the Bible say that there were extra human beings, not, not angels necessarily. That's not what they're called in the Bible. They're called the sons, plural, of God. Now, if you're about to hit stop because of heresies, don't. That's, that's a biblical term. Sons of God is a biblical term. It shows up multiple times in the Old Testament. Adam is listed in the genealogy of Christ as, one, as a son of God. And he is, because who else is Adam a son of, the first man? Jesus is a son of God. He's the preeminent son of God. And he's often, um, and if you want, if you need a cross reference on this, go to Colossians 1, 1 through 15. He's the preeminent. He's far and above the other sons of God. But there are sons, plural, of God. And what Genesis chapter 6, especially verses 1 through 4 says, is that there were sons of God who saw the daughters of men and the uh, the Aramaic term or the Hebrew term for men is Adam, the daughters of Adam, and said, I would kind of like a wife. And they left. And if you put together the pieces of the Pauline, um, by, by Pauline, I mean the Apostle Paul and some of Judah, uh, sorry, of Jude and what they say, it says they left their Oketerion, their habitat, and they entered into this realm of men and they had actual sexual union with the daughters of men and they had children. This is what the book of Enoch's about. So in Genesis, we get like three or four verses in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And a lot of people say, look, you know, Joel, Dan, if this was such a big deal, why wouldn't Genesis have more on this? And that's a valid question. And I would answer that question by saying, because anybody from the ancient time was very, very familiar with this narrative and it didn't need to be repeated. I would challenge you to find an ancient historical culture, whether it be 
Aboriginal, Olmec, Toltec, Mayan, Nordic, Asian, Middle Eastern, Native American, where when you go all the way back, that this story isn't in there. It's in all of them, including Genesis. And I think Genesis, of course, is the authoritative one. But Genesis kind of glances off of this. And so you've, you've got, what you get is you get Adam is created. There's the fall of man in the Adam and Eve story in Genesis chapter three. Then you get kind of mankind increasing on the earth in Genesis chapter four and five. And then you get to the beginning of Genesis chapter six. And you can suddenly get this crazy narrative that says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took on them of wives. And, and then within a chapter, you get the total implosion of humanity the destruction of humanity and God saying, yeah, we're guys, we're going to have to have a flood and start over. It's, now, if you have no, if, if all you're thinking is, well, mankind was, they got kind of bad and they did some bad things. Well, then why do we not have floods now? The, the, what the historical narrative is taking for granted is that the reader has an appreciation for the fact that that fall of the sons of God and that intercourse with the daughters of men that created offspring messed up the world so badly that the flood was necessary. And we have no real biblical commentary on that, but that that period is what the book of Enoch is about, is what happened between those kind of sons of God and daughters of men. And Enoch is, um, he's often called the scribe, the scribe Enoch, because his job was to write stuff down. And he was basically a messenger. He carried messages back and forth, primarily and Dan, you can comment on this if you want, primarily between God and these fallen sons of God who are often referred to as the watchers. Now, the watchers, if you're not familiar with that term, that is also a biblical term. You can find it in the book of Daniel chapter four. It, it's a, a class of, or not even a class, it's a, it's a, it's an, I want to say angel, but angel's not the right word either. It's the watching is something that certain sons of God do. They watch and you get this in Daniel very blatantly and they have authority and they make decisions. But then you also get these allusions to it in Ezekiel and other places where they talk about these angelic beings being symbolically covered with eyes, which means they're watching, they're watching. And one of the things Enoch describes is the first role of the watchers among God's creation of humankind was to help them out. He said, guide them, help them out, teach them some stuff. But then the problem is the watchers who were interacting with humanity started to take it a lot further. So jump in, Dan. I'm talking too yeah. much, but jump jump in on, on that. What does Enoch say about what happened there? Yeah. Because well, he so, gives he, he names names. <laughs> like this yeah, is like he, like page six. Like he, he gives like the 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 down and dirty of like what happened and whose fault it was and what they said and who agreed to what. Yeah, and like I said earlier, there was there's a very interesting conversation recorded uh, and I'll, I can just read part of it here this is in chapter six uh, I'll just so you're in Enoch Enoch six yeah I'll, I'll just read all of chapter six because it's only yeah. like Joel mentioned these chapters are some of them only a couple verses so it says and it came to pass when the sons of men had increased that in those days there were born to them fair and beautiful daughters and the angels, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the children of men, and let us beget for ourselves children. And uh, Semyaza, who I'm not sure how to pronounce that, who was their leader, said to them, I fear that you may not wish this deed to be done, and that I alone will pay for this great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and bind one another with curses so not to alter this plan but to carry out this plan effectively then they all swore together and all bound one another with curses to it and they were in all 200 and they came down came down on artis which is the summit of mount hermon and they called the mountain hermon because on it they swore and bound to one another with curses all right, super helpful context. And I'm, I'm going to give the Cliff Notes version of that. So Mount Hermon is a mountain in northern Israel. It's the highest point in Israel. And what this is saying is 200 angels, angels who, and I'm using that word loosely, sons of God, watchers, 
who predated the creation of mankind. Again, if you're freaking out, you need to go listen to some earlier episodes. That's biblical. They predated the creation of mankind. Saw the daughters of mankind and said, we're going to do a bad thing. We're going to leave our primary, and I'm using the word habitat because the the Greek word that's referenced is okateria, and that's a good translation of it. We're going to leave our habitat, and we're going to join the human habitat so we can have these wives. And they do. So that's in Enoch 6. It's also in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. This is not disputed in scripture. There are some people who try and say that sons of God just means the righteous men saw unrighteous women and were attracted to them and had some offspring of dubious origin who maybe weren't very righteous. That is not at all what this is talking about. This is talking about an extra human race that predates humanity, the angels, right? I mean, is Gabriel a human? Yeah. Is Michael a human? No, they're not. There's something before that. And this names names and says, Shimyaza had a conversation with a bunch of his pals. I was like, hey, guys, if we're going to do, are you guys going to leave me high and dry? You know, it's kind of, I, I remember I'm going to tell a very quick story. Um, and I don't know if Ed Peak is listening. Adam Peak may listen later, but uh, once upon a time in my youthful indiscretion days, many, many, uh, actually more than 20 years ago, I was dry ice bombing a house that happened to belong to Ed Peak. And I had a cohort, I had a buddy who was my getaway car. And uh, not necessarily through his fault, but because a cop showed up in the middle of my dry, dry ice bombing of Ed Peak's house, my getaway car left and I was high and dry, you know, <laughs> standing there with, you know, absolutely red handed going, oh no, I have nowhere to go. So that's what Shim is. He's like, guys, if I go down and take a human wife and humans are of the dust of the earth. Adam's created of the dust of the earth. He, he's, he's, a, he's a terrestrial being. He's of the earth. And he's saying, if I, who am not of the earth, go down and take a wife who is of the earth, I know I'm breaking a lot of rules. Are you, you, you 200 dudes, I use that term more loosely than it's ever been used. <laughs> uh, are you guys for sure coming with me? Because I'm going to be in big trouble. And what Enoch says in Enoch 6 is they all agreed and swore like, yeah, we're going with you. We're not going to leave you out there. Let's do this. And they did. And they descended down upon the summit of Mount Hermon. And I think there was a, I, I don't want to get in, in this episode. I, we can get into it later um, of, you know, physically, well, can angels, you know, have physical union with women? Yes, they can. There are many Orthodox sects, that's S-E- CTS that say that that is impossible and it's all on this weird spiritual level. That is not what the Bible describes. It's not what Enoch describes, and it's it's not biblical. They physically entered the realm of humanity and physically had union with human women and had offspring. And those and offspring, offspring were, were a problem. Yeah, go for it. That go take because that that was the problem is they had offspring. And there was the first problem is that they they disobeyed and took these human women. The second problem is and they made babies and these babies biblically are called abominations and they shouldn't have happened. All right. So one one comment before we dive into that is the the significance of Mount Hermon. Uh, remember this was written before Christ and Christ came and the transfiguration happened on the summit of the Mount Hermon. So, you know, just put that together. It's, it's a, Mount, Mount Hermon's a big deal. I live in Monument, Colorado. There is a Mount Hermon here. It's not the same Mount Hermon, but it's a good reminder. Mount Hermon's a big deal in scripture. It's, it's a very big deal. It's an extremely important place. All right. So back to these, these horrible offspring. Uh, the, and it, if you, if you're curious about reading this book, uh, just as I was, I was going through it, if, if you just want to dip your toes into the book, I would read chapters 6 through 10, which is not going to take very long. And then you'll probably go back and read 1 through 36. But 6 through 10 is where a lot of this, the, the real meat happens here. Um, so in chapter 7, it starts 
talking about some of these these offspring, which were giants and uh, how they uh, devoured mankind. They began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. And I mean, these were these were not just sinners. These were some uh, seriously bad seeds roaming the earth. Which, uh, to go back to something we alluded to earlier, is about about the earth, the flood not happening just because people were sinning. And, uh, and even a lot of the violence you see in the Old Testament. And this is, I think, part of why it's important uh, for Christians to be familiar with some of this stuff. Is, uh, you know, non-believers will often point to the violence of the Old Testament as, as if something to discredit. God can't be love and peace and all the things that Jesus is if there was all this violence in the Old Testament. And and the violence is, is about much more than um, punishing people who weren't doing their best. A lot of this was a genetic warfare on a, on a level where, and, and we'll we'll get into this deeper and further in future podcasts uh, about kind of what this means and and well, the context around take, it. Just to give a teaser, why genetic warfare? Why is it so important that the human race is destroyed? Uh, because and God I, have, I have my answers, Adam, but I think yeah, better too. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot for it. God created Adam and gave him dominion over the earth. And that that is something that was gifted to humankind. And now you have the watchers coming and trying to uh, take that away and, and kind of intermingle themselves with, with humanity. And so when, you know, what you talks about, the Bible talks about, and Enoch talks about how Noah was pure in his generations and you know, basically a pure hum, actual human bloodline and, and the, the importance of that. And that, you know, then Jesus comes along and he refers to himself often as the son of man uh, because he was fully man and fully god and that and they took is, they took his generations all the way back to adam to right. to prove it they proved right. that he is actually fully human right so what do so, you think yeah, Joel? so I, I think well first of all so that that's exactly right that humankind is really important because it has the dominion of the earth and um you know, if we had Tim Alberino as a guest, hint, hint, I want to someday. I don't know if we will, <laughs> but I know you and I have read a lot of his stuff. You know, he'll go into that. Yeah. Additionally, and on top of that, the reason why the, just to overuse the term, the broadly fallen term, fallen angels, the reason why the fallen angels, plural or singular, would want to destroy humanity is because in Genesis chapter 3, then God, the creator, told Satan, or the evil one, who is also referenced in Revelation as being the one who was in the garden, except then he's a red dragon, but he's the serpent of old, that the seed of the woman would crush his head. And what happens from there on out, starting with Cain and Abel and continuing on broad scale in Genesis 6 with this fall of the watchers, is an attempt to wipe out and destroy humanity. And I know we haven't talked about it a lot, but if you go to Jubilees and some of these others, then what was happening between the fall of the Watchers and the flood was human beings were becoming really scarce. There was uh, th these offspring that Dan's been describing and that Enoch describes, they started off just being really, really powerful hybrid beings. And then as they multiplied, then they started to eclipse the whole idea of humanity because they started to run out of food. And, and by the way, so the word for them is Nephilim. Nephilim is a very controversial word. Some people say it's Nephal, which means the fallen ones. Uh, I disagree. I don't think it translates to Nephal. I'm a, I go a little bit more with Michael Heisner, a little bit less with George Pember on that, but who cares what I think? It's just I, I'm right or wrong and, or, or somewhere in between. Who, who knows? So you have the Nephilim, 
the Greek translation in the Septuagint of Nephilim is the the uh, gigantes, which means really, really big deal. And it could also mean really, really big people. And then another term for them is the gibberim. So you get the, basically what it means is you get these people that are somewhere between humans and lowercase g gods. And lo and behold, that's extremely common in ancient mythology, not just Greek mythology, where it is very, very common, but also uh, Ugaritic, Sumerian, Babylonian mythology. I mean, you go all the way back to um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest written stories we have. Gilgamesh is being described as this superhuman being who's like 12 feet tall, and you can find carvings of him holding lions under his arms like they're kittens. He's not a regular dude. He's something in between. So you get this generation of beings that are the resulting offspring from these angels falling and having sexual union with human women, and they have children, and these children are not human children. They're something else, and they cause all kinds of problems. And Dan mentioned they eat flesh, they drink blood. That is literally where the term bloodthirsty comes from. They're bloodthirsty. And you notice in the Bible, in many places, starting right after the flood of Noah, but also continuing all the way through Acts chapter 15, one of the most important things you can do is, guys, don't drink the blood. Don't drink blood. Blood's very, very, very important, except for Christ, who says, drink my blood, none other. Really important stuff. But one other thing I want to highlight here that I think is important is if you put this in perspective in Genesis, there are two falls so far, and there will be a third in Genesis. The first fall is the fall of man, and that's Eve in the garden. The second fall is the fall, and that's in Genesis chapter three. The second fall in Genesis is the fall of the sons of God, and that is what the book of Enoch is all about. And the third fall comes at more like circa Genesis 10, 11, 11 specifically, is the uh, the fall of the nations, which is in Babel. And so we'll, we'll talk about that another time. So in Genesis 3, where you have the fall of woman, what happens? You have the woman who is a very special creation for Adam. And I want to highlight, because this is very important, only Adam gets a wife. The woman is a special creation in Genesis, the first few chapters of Genesis. And she gets, a, a, Eve gets a, a long description in, of her creation versus Adam, who gets like a, a verse or two. Eve gets like a chapter. And there is a, a, a really intricate description of the creation of Eve. And, and I think that's really important just as, as we, you know, just walk through our lives as human beings, I think we should not take for granted that woman is a really, really, really important and unique creation. And it, as far as we can tell in scripture, and Jesus even has some commentary on this, there is no parallel creation in the, for lack of a better term, angelic realm. The watchers don't seem to have wives. Now, I, there, people will disagree, whatever, whatever. But biblically, I cannot find that the watchers have wives or offspring, except for when they see human wives and go, wow, that's an amazing creation. I want that. So I think the creation of woman in Genesis is extremely important. And Adam's exaltation over the creation of woman, when he says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And God says, go produce, bring forth offspring, fill the earth and subdue it. That's an extremely unique and profound charge. Then we just get a couple chapters down the road where these watchers are going, I kind of want some of this. So here's where I want to contrast this. The fall of the watchers in Genesis 6 and in the book of Enoch, is a mirror. By mirror, I mean inverse fall versus Eve in the garden. Because what does Eve do? Eve trades herself for knowledge of greater things. What did she eat of? She ate of the tree of the knowledge of the good of good and evil, which is described, by the way, in Enoch. You want to know what the fruit looked like? 
it's an Enoch. He describes the tree and the fruit and what it looks like. And it's not apples. It's a, that's a, that's a, a modern thing. It's not an apple on the tree. So Eve trades herself for knowledge of good and evil. Adam goes along with it, not because he's deceived. Paul's clear on that. He wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing. He goes along with it to support Eve. He wants to be with his wife. And then a couple of chapters later, you have these watchers who are trading knowledge of higher things so that they can have, and I'm going to use the word knowledge again, knowledge of woman. And the reason I use that word is because if you look at Genesis chapter four, verse one, it says Adam knew, and it's the same word, knew his wife Eve and she conceived. And then you get watchers knowing human women in Genesis six and conceiving while Eve had traded herself for knowledge of good and evil. So Dan, what does it say in Enoch or what are some of the things it mentions as these watchers trading in exchange? Cause there's an actual exchange that's going on here. It's, it's not, they're not just coming in and pillaging earth. They, they are, especially their offspring. But when they first show up, there's a little bit of an arrangement and a trade that they say, if this, then that. And what does Enoch give us in terms of what was happening in those early conversations? And I'm going to throw a little speculation in here that may be completely wrong as to who and how and what and why, but what's being traded in uh, in Enoch? What knowledge is being handed around? Uh, well, in chapter eight, you have you have it talking about how they taught men how to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working with them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of uh, basically medicines and makeup and things to beautify. It says specifically beautifying the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones. And uh, so a whole range of things from weapons to medicine to makeup and, uh, and and there's I think there's other sections too but that's just one section that talks about it yeah so what we get in Enoch is there's a, a transaction of higher knowledge being traded in exchange for wives which I would say is another kind of knowledge for, I, I will, I will trade you my knowledge of heavenly realms for knowledge of you know, this earthly woman. And that, you know, these watchers who, by the way, are not idiots. They're, they're in many ways, wiser, more informed than we are, are more interested in that than in the stuff they know. And it's, you know, metallurgy and herbs and makeup and sorcery. Sorcery is mentioned many times. Um, it's a, which sorcery just meaning the, these watchers exchange the ability for these human women to, access these heavenly realms and taught them how to do it. And that was a big, big no-no, by the way. And and by the way, file that. If you're listening, file that because gosh, that's that's gonna that's going to inform so much. You want to get into the mounds of the giants and portals and all this kind of stuff and paranormal and it's gonna come back to the ability to access other realms human beings ability to access their realms realms. I mean, that's, that's divination, it's sorcery, it's um, necromancy. Uh, that's what this stuff is. So somehow somebody told people how to do it and in exchange, they got wives. I, I'm going to just float this. And this, by the way, is not completely original to me. Um, there's an author, um, I'm blanking his first name and his last name is Peterson. And he writes a, a pretty good book on the Watchers. I wouldn't agree with every single thing. He discounts Enoch a lot, whereas I take Enoch very seriously. Um, but one of the things he points out is if you look at the genealogies in Genesis, then there's a man named Lamech. Now there's two Lamechs. There's good Lamech and bad Lamech. If you go to bad Lamech, bad Lamech, uh, who was a, a son of Cain or a descendant of Cain, uh, as opposed to Abel, whereas good Lamech was a descendant of Seth, who was the kind of the successor of Abel. Um, has daughters that are named beautiful. And it's the only genealogy that describes the men and the women of the household. And it says that he is a, um, that he has multiple wives and he's also a wicked man. As far as we can tell from the genealogy. And all of a sudden you see this explosion of knowledge in his family and his sons suddenly become really good at metallurgy and music. One of his sons is Jubal, who becomes Jubilee. So, uh, and, and you have Tubal Cain. So, uh, 
you've got this family line that suddenly explodes with all this knowledge. And I think there's an argument to be made, and it's not a hill to die on, but an argument to be made that this is the family line where these watchers um, became active and said, give me your daughters and I'll give you knowledge. And they said, okay. And some things began to blow up there. That w- all, By the way, it, it does line up with the timeline of when the watchers ascended, you know, days of Jared and all that. So I'm floating it out there for those of you who are um, you know, four or five layers deep in this, go, go look that up. Tell me if you think I'm way off. That's fine. Uh, if, if you all yell at me, I'm going to blame it on Peterson. You know, he came up with it first, but I think he has some merit to it. So let's get a little further into the book of Enoch. Who is Enoch in the book and what's his role and what does he do? Yeah, he's, so he's, I think you mentioned earlier, like he's a messenger going back and forth, uh, talking with God and and being shown some of these things that have happened, and also uh, it seems like talking with some of the these fallen watchers, and uh, almost being like a, a go between. And I, well, not even almost. I'd say he's more. he's he's precisely a go between. <laughs> right. So what happens is they fall, and they're suddenly very much in timeout, and they know it, and they they ask Enoch, to like, hey, God won't talk to us anymore because we did this really bad thing by leaving heaven to join Earth so that we could have offspring could you please go tell him we're very, very sorry and we sure would like to be forgiven? And Enoch, to his credit, and, and again, we, we don't know, but this is what the ancient texts seem to indicate. He does. He, he says, okay. And he brings before God, like God, the Almighty, the Creator, he brings the plea for mercy of the fallen watchers and says, Hey God, they're really, they're feeling terrible about this. They sure would like to have fellowship with you. Uh, is there anything you can do here? And God's response, um, it's kind of rough. He says, no, that's his response. He says, absolutely not. You've, and this is what Dan was alluding to a little bit earlier, like you've royally messed up the human race. And in no uncertain terms, you are not going to be restored to good standing. In fact, you're going to be banished into imprisonment. And this is, you can find this in the book of Second Peter, where he talks about, uh, if you want to look up in you know, a Greek um, dictionary, Tartarus, they're banished to Tartarus. They're banished to this pseudo hell. And and in fact, and then God has a conversation with Enoch, and I'm trying to turn to it here, but I'm not super familiar with this copy of Enoch, where God actually tells Enoch, he says, go tell them, why are you sending Enoch to ask me for mercy when you should be actually interceding to me on behalf of man? So he says, your job was to help lead and protect and guide mankind and you've messed up mankind and now you're sending mankind to ask for help? No. That's his response. Which, from a Christian perspective, is really something. But when I say from a Christian perspective, who are Christians? Sons and daughters of Adam are Christians. Not sons and daughters of God in terms of... Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm setting up that tension on purpose. Who are Christians? Are the watchers Christians? No, they're not. Christ died for man and women. And, you know, there's the sons and daughters of Adam. That's why Jesus refers to himself so consistently as a son of man. And so we have, we as men and women on the earth have this option. It's such a weak word, but we have this, this open door of mercy, where we can say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And the Bible says, you ask for forgiveness, you'll be forgiven. 
because Christ died for that. Jesus paid for that forgiveness. Well, set up the contrast of these watchers who Christ for whom Christ did not die biblically. And you can actually see that in Hebrews, it literally says Jesus did not die for the angels. He died for man. So Christ did not die for the angels. He died for man. And so we have this open door of mercy where we can go say, hey, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And the Bible assures us that we're forgiven. Well, then you see these beings who are, by all intents and purposes, you know, they're create they're higher beings. I mean, Shemyaza, Azazel, I mean, they're these words, these beings that are described, they're they're way more as a being than I am. And yet they appeal to the mercy of God. And his answer is no. Banishment. And it really drives home this idea of the gospel. Not the idea. I'm using these words. I don't, when I come, they come out of my mouth. I'm like, that's not a big enough word. It really drives home this incredible appreciation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of what Jesus did for us. What would the watchers give to have an open door of forgiveness and mercy? Because they've been in Tartarus ever since. Whereas you and I, according to the Bible, can just under the blood of Christ say, have mercy. And God says, yes, I have mercy. Whereas in Enoch, we get this really uncommon, well, something we're very unfamiliar with of this, this image of, uh, you know, a heartfelt repentance. And he says, absolutely not to hell with you. And I use hell loosely because that isn't thoroughly defined in these passages of scripture. But I don't know, Dan, what, what do you think? Am I way off there in terms of what happens when, you know, en- they, they, they ask Enoch, Enoch brings it to God. And God sends them back with a real rough message. And then there's more to that message. And you're welcome to add some of that if you want. Yeah, and I think it it just highlights again God's love for his people that, you know, he, he created us with a purpose. And, uh, and he loves us so deeply. And these beings came along and tried to mess it all up. And... Uh, took matters into their own hands and took things that weren't given to them. And God takes that stuff very seriously. And, you know, they knew what they were doing. And you look at, I think sometimes we can struggle with God giving mercy to uh, people who are these, you know, horrible sinners. And you're like, well, all they have to do is ask for forgiveness and you'll forgive them. And, and, you know, you see that Jesus did die for us, and it is, but that doesn't mean that God's just out there being soft on on sin and destruction. Uh, God takes sin and destruction very seriously as well. And, you know, I, th- I think it's important just to bring it back to the gospel, because this podcast is going to get into a lot, of, a lot of weird things and a lot of things that make you question a lot of what you've been taught in Sunday school just because you know you hear all these Bible stories and and it doesn't go into this this depth and and this stuff that really sounds pretty weird at first uh, but nothing that we talk about here changes the truth of the of the gospel uh, or the truth that Jesus came died rose again defeated life, uh, defeated death, and that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And, you know, that is ultimately paramount in what it's all about. This just gives some more history about kind of what what set all this stuff up. And because all that stuff is, is a huge mystery. And really, even with all this extra color added to it, still remains far beyond our grasp. Uh, but you know, this at least paints a little bit more of the picture. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to read briefly from Enoch 10. Again, these are short chapters, but it gives you a sense of how these things are painted. And it's it's really profound stuff. And again, it's not the Bible, but this is the kind of stuff that the readers of the Bible were familiar with. So this says, then the Most High said, So then said the Most High, the great Holy One, so that's the Lord God, he said, Uriel, Uriel is one of the angels who is good and who does not fall. 
He's right up there alongside Raphael, Michael, Gabriel, etc. Go to the son of Lamech. Son of Lamech is Noah. So that's the good Lamech as opposed to the bad Lamech that I mentioned earlier. And so God sends Uriel and says, go to Noah and tell him my name. Hide yourself. Reveal to him that the end is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed, and that a flood is about to come on the whole earth and it will destroy everything on it. And now instruct him as to what he must do to escape that his offspring may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel. Azazel was one of the leading fallen angels. So you had a Shemyaza and Azazel were some of the ones that really, really broke the rules. Bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and split open the desert, which is in Dudael, and cast him in and fill the hole by covering him with rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him live forever and ever and cover his face that he may not see light. So that's that to me, I'm going to take a shortcut here. That's Tartarus. When you go to the Greek concept of Tartarus, it's this alternative hell. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be hurled into the fire. So that's fast forwarding to the great day of judgment, which has not happened yet, which we see referred to in Revelation. And heal the earth, which the angels have ruined. So I'm in, I'm in um, uh, Enoch 10.7. I think this is true. Heal the earth, which the angels have ruined, and proclaim the healing of the earth. For I will restore the earth and heal the plague that not all of the children of men may perish through all of the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. Now, if you want to get really weird about this, go to the book of Numbers, look up the um, the, the the festival of the... And, uh, and Daniel will have to help me out on this, but the festival in the book of Numbers where you have the goat on which is given all of the, he's basically the scapegoat where all the sins of him are placed. If you look up the original Hebrew on that, it's Day of Atonement, sorry. Um, then that goat's name in the original Hebrew is Azazel. It's, it's translated in your English Bible as scapegoat. But if you look at the Hebrew, it's Azazel. He's called the one to whom all sin is ascribed. And a lot of that's coming back to this early text. To Gabriel, the Lord said, proceed against, and I'm going to use some strong language here, but this is how it's translated. Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication. So he's talking about those those offspring between the angels and the sons, uh, or sorry, the daughters of men that never should have existed. And destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers. Cause them to go against one another that they may destroy each other in battle, shorten their days. No request that the watchers, their fathers, make of you shall be granted to them on their behalf. For they hope to live an eternal life, and each one of them shall live 500 years. Then the Lord said to Michael, so third angel mentioned here, go bind Shemyaza, who was the other leader, the guy who originally made everybody promise, and his team who have associated with women and have defiled themselves in their uncleanness. When their sons have slain one another and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for 70 generations under the hills of the earth. Now that's weird. Hmm. Bind them for 70 generations. That means that they're not bound forever. (laughs) Coming back until the day of consummation, their judgment until the eternal judgment is accomplished. In those days, they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment in prison in which they shall be confined forever. Then Shemyaza shall be burnt up with the condemned, and they shall be destroyed, having been bound together with them for the end of all generations. So kind of the consummation of that promise they made. So here's what this is saying. Not a lot of mercy for these fallen angels. And the Lord really holds against them their destruction of humankind. And he speaks against them these temporary judgments that will then be carried off in eternity, which is... And now if you go read the book of Revelation, you're going to have, even just with that little passage I've read, it's going to inform your reading of the book of Revelation because that's the kind of stuff it's talking about. And then if you read the the feasts and how, or sorry, not the feasts, but the sacrifices and how you have the scapegoat being attributed all sin and realizing they're talking about the same guy. And then if you want to get really eerie, you can go into Josephus and some of these other places where it talks about why those sacrifices stopped after Christ died. This stuff all ties together. So now reading those passages, just that short 
portion, it informs several other portions in scripture. And you can read scripture having a sense of what those original readers would have been familiar with and could have taken for granted and why Genesis chapter six verses one through four doesn't have to go into great detail because there already was a lot of detail provided and people were already familiar with it. So it just didn't need to be uh, deeply explored. Like if I say, oh, it's like the Twin Towers, and then I just move on. Well, everybody of certain generations has so much understanding of what that means. I don't need to say a lot more because everybody knows that, you know, there's such a cultural impact of what that means. That's what this fall of the watchers and fornication with the daughters of men meant. Culturally, it was very, very well ingrained. And you can't find an ancient tradition that doesn't have this included. So it was so well informed that the Bible didn't have to say much about it. But we, as these postmodern American Western evangelical Christians, we have very little sense of it. So we read this one verse and we're all confused about, or these four verses of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, we're all confused about it. And Enoch gives us some perspective. And it gives us, I think, a very good source of perspective on where that would have come from and why. So Dan, we're a little over an hour here, and I really appreciate your participation. What else do you want to say about Enoch? And I, I've got a couple of really weird and eerie things to point out that may or may not be valid. So before I go off into left field, what do you think our audience should know or uh, should be thinking of when they think of Christ and the gospel and their Bible or all these things? How does this all play in together if somebody is uh, thinking about reading the book of Enoch or starting to appreciate this um, narrative from scripture? So I think one thing that's going to keep coming up in this podcast also is the importance of taking a step back and realizing that this whole story is not ultimately about us. It's it's about God, right? It, it all come, ultimately comes back to Jesus. And we tend to be pretty arrogant whether we will admit it or not with the way we interpret things and read things and we filter everything through our own experience uh like you know with the for quick example when it says um they'll be in prison for 70 generations if you try to do the math on it you probably figure out what you think a generation is what they're talking about as a generation is probably something very different and so there's so many things like that with scripture where we don't have a, a real, as much of an understanding as we like to think, uh, even though we will say that we don't put God in a box, we really do, right? We, we try to get all this kind of figured out in a way that we can kind of grasp it and understand it. And anytime we've done that, we're missing it because God is so much bigger and there's so much more to him and there's so much more to the story. But yet the story really does still all come back to Jesus. And it is ultimately all about Jesus. And that's the, the thing to really keep in mind is, is as, as you read this stuff and get exposed to more of this stuff and it expands your view of what uh, the history of the universe really entails, to be open to that expansion of, of understanding, but also not to get thrown off by it because it, still all does come back to Jesus. Well, I think that's a really good reminder. And if you're going to take the book of Enoch seriously, say, okay, you have sons of God, daughters of men. You also have Adam being listed as a son of God. Well, who else is listed as a son of God? Jesus. He's the preeminent son of God. Well, in that case, I challenge you to go read your Bible with the mindset that Jesus is the preeminent son of God among many sons of God and those fallen sons of God become the false gods of the nations. And we've talked about that a little bit on some earlier podcasts. There's a lot more detail to go into there. And that's why you see Jesus saying things like in Matthew 28, where he says, Hey, all the authority of the nation's been given back to me. Go tell mm -hmm. the nations. That's why you see 
uh, the day of Pentecost being described the way it is. That's why Babel happens the way it does. That's why God is saying, hey, stop worshiping false gods. This is the real God. Or don't go after those other gods. And that's why you see Psalm 82, him scolding those gods, saying, why have you done such a bad job running the nations? That's why you see Psalm 2, him saying, hey, kiss the true son of God before you get destroyed. And that's a, a nod to Armageddon, for example. And that's why you see Revelation being described the way it is. This is why Jesus is a really big deal. Jesus is not just a nice guy that God created to help cover the sins of man. He, that's Jesus did cover the sins of man, but much more importantly, Jesus is the, the preeminent son of God who defeats all the evil forces and reconciles all the authority, not to mention just mankind, but also the entire fallen universe back to recognition of the authority of God and that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's what scripture is really talking about. And Paul says this kind of stuff all the time. Now, just, just as a teaser for people who um, want something a little weirder, and I mentioned to Dan beforehand, I said, hey, I'm going to throw this out there. And he was like, whoa, <laughs> that's fine. I, there's got to there's gotta be a little woo-woo in every one of these episodes. Here's your woo-woo for this episode. Enoch describes being taken to a place where there is no substance anywhere, nothing above or below or around him. And that place is, uh, I would argue, space. He says, I was in a place where there was nothing. There was nothing above me. There was nothing below me. There was no sky. There was no ground. And then he says, but what there were, were seven burning mountains, seven huge, massive burning things. And those, this was the area where these fallen sons of God were imprisoned. Okay. I'm going to throw something out there. And again, this is woo-woo. For those of you who like woo-woo, for those of you who don't, leave it alone. What are the seven burning mountains in space? Well, there's one well-known constellation that is actually mentioned in scripture a couple of times, especially in the book of Job, that is known as the seven stars, the seven sisters, and it's the Pleiades. Okay, cool. There's a constellation of seven stars called the Pleiades. And Job actually mentions them. And it's always Pleiades and Orion. Pleiades and Orion are the two star systems that are mentioned. Okay. So getting really weird, those of you who are really up on your extraterrestrial and UFO lore, who are the two strains of extraterrestrials? An argument, arguably. If you go look up who are the Pleiadians in the extraterrestrial concepts, who's coming from the Pleiades, who are you going to get? Well, you're going to get the the Nordics, the Space Brothers. And if those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. You can skip this. But those of you who do know what I'm talking about, your eyebrows are probably getting worked out right now. You get the Nordics, the Space Brothers, the beautiful ones, the ones who show up with beautiful messages for humanity, very much along the lines of Paul saying, don't you know that the devil himself can show up as an angel of light? So I'm all I'm trying to do there is connect a line of consistency between the book of Enoch through the New Testament to the extraterrestrial literature today saying something is associated with the Pleiades that is also beautiful fallen angels that have a message of what appears to be hope, but is actually corruption for humanity. And again, if we had Tim Alberino on here, I would hope that he wouldn't laugh at me and would maybe have, would maybe agree that there's maybe something to that. Because I think the uh, Pleiadians in the extraterrestrial lore, and when I say lore, I mean, you know, arising in the last 30 to 50 years, um, they're consistent. On the other side, you have the those from Orion or Scorpio. Uh, we'll save those for future episodes. But let me float that. Are the fallen sons of God in the book of Enoch and in Genesis 1 through 6? And where is their binding in whatever Tartarus is? And some of you will say, well, that's in the earth. Maybe. Maybe it is. But also Enoch describes a 
outer space kind of seven star place and we get these beings coming from somewhere else claiming to be from the Pleiades. And apparently their binding was temporary. I don't know. I don't know. We're thinking about sneak preview for future episodes. I'm not going to draw a lot of conclusions, but I'm going to keep asking questions like that. So Dan, we're about an hour and 15 minutes in. We are nearly up to the length of the episode that uh, Brian Brown and I did, uh, which I think everybody saw coming, but you know, you're, you're not known as the longest preacher. So (laughs) we've, we've dragged this out, but the book of Enoch is well worth it. Um, any final closing thoughts, anything that you think people need to have? And, and I'd, I'd encourage you to offer whatever the Lord puts on your heart in terms of uh, encouragement to the church, because some people may be freaked out. Some people may be confused. Some people may be um, excited about the wrong things. What do people need to walk away from this episode considering as far as, uh, as far as on your heart? Uh, like I said earlier, it all really does come back to Jesus. And as much as these things are kind of mind blowing and mind bending and make you go back and, and question things you've read before or been taught before. Uh, I mean, it's important. Just remember that we know who wins, right? We know, we know the end of the story. We know what God has planned for those who love him. We know that Jesus opened the way for us to be saved. And, and so you, as much as all this other information gets thrown at you and you start processing it, keep coming back to that truth, the gospel truth, uh, because that is really what's most important. And I'll, I'll leave it with that. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm not going to pile on that. I think Dan's got it exactly right. So thank you, my friends, our friends, brothers and sisters, um, friends, Romans, countrymen, if you want to get Shakespearean. Thank you for listening and joining. I, I expect that this conversation on the book of Enoch is a little bit more than your average, you know, uh, small talk conversation. I hope that this podcast is providing that for you to some extent, but more than that, I really hope it's inspiring you to have other conversations. I hope that this is um, something that sparks a lot of conversation, a lot of thought, maybe some reading, maybe some research, maybe some other podcasts uh, for you. I hope that if you're listening to this with a friend, then you have somebody to talk to about it. If you don't, then send it to a friend who you think is open-minded if you don't have any friends like that, then write to us, mysterybibleon at gmail.com. We would love to hear your thoughts. We've had a couple of people reaching out. and man, It means a lot to have people say, wow, that was really neat. I really like this. I have a question here or there. We'll, we'll do our best to address those things. This podcast is an experiment. This is literally me and Dan and Brian and some uh, wonderful people that uh, know each other from former ministry, just just trying to float some fun things for people to be able to listen to and think about and appreciate. I do encourage you, by the way, so let's, I just want to acknowledge that this stuff is weird. Nobody talks about the book of Enoch day to day. Nobody talks about the fallen sons of God day to day. Nobody talks about Nephilim or giants day to day. And those people who do are weird. But I would encourage you, based on my own experience, and Dan, maybe based on yours, and based on some testimony I've heard from other people, there's probably more people thinking about this stuff than you think. And I have not had yet a single negative or bad conversation with anybody of, of any walk of life, of any background, somebody who wants to have an outlet to discuss the weird stuff. And I think being able to bring them those things from a biblical perspective is very profound and very powerful. I've talked to people who have zero background in the Bible, but when they find out that you're willing to talk about what's a UFO, what's an alien, what might that be, where might that be coming from, 
does the Bible have anything to say about it? Boy, people will open up. So if you want to have fun conversations, then this is the kind of stuff that is worth being armed with. So I encourage you to share it. I ask you to share it, honestly. Uh, you know, post the stuff on social media. You're probably going to find that people don't think as weird. They don't think you're as weird as you think they might think. And the people that do are boring people, and at least you know who not to hang out with anymore. So yeah. just um, be open-minded and recognize that a lot of other people really, really want an outlet for these conversations. They would love to have a place to see what the Bible has to say. They want to have a rational conversation, something that's not informed by, you know, LSD and weed and, um, you know, woo-woo stuff. If you want to know what the Bible has to say on this stuff, then that, that's what Mystery Bible Arm is all about. So, I, Dan, thank you very much for being here today. I absolutely expect that we will see you on future episodes. I'm not sure which ones those will, will be, but I know we've talked a little bit offline on them. And whatever you guys think it's going to be, it's not that. It's something weird. Uh, we'll probably get Brian back on here soon. You might get a little bit of me. And uh, some of you listening may also be future co-hosts. So keep up to speed and uh, we absolutely welcome your input, your suggestions, everything you've got. We love you guys. We're so grateful for each and every one of you tuning in and being willing to listen to this stuff. It's so much fun for us to be able to share it and know that it's reaching people who care. Um, At the end of the day, it's the Bible. It's the gospel. It's Jesus. It's always Christ. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you on the next episode.